Back to my original screen. So yeah, for those of you who may have just joined us, um, asking everyone to enter their uh, their first name uh, and what problem they're having with their shoulder. I see uh, someone from Lake Agassiz. Um, I don't know if that's the school, the entire school from Lake Agassiz, that'd be awesome. Uh, but uh, I have a lot of pain in the right shoulder, dull ache, and still have range of motion. I take that to mean that you're having, um, you still have full range of motion. If not, uh, let me know. And oh, hey, Larry, thank you for the sharing that. I appreciate it. So um, do you have full range of motion or uh, you're limited in range of motion? You have some, uh, you can't sleep at night and some weakness. We are going to address the, the pain at night um, uh, aspect. Uh, it's a common question that we get, uh, but I will do that towards the end when we uh, do our uh, frequently asked questions. So uh, I'll, I'll enter that in there. And uh, we have a nice crowd today, uh, 10 participants. Love it. So we'll get you, we'll get you rolling. So um, get this out of our way. Uh, and there's a little delay in my, with all the applications here. Um, my name is Jeff Barta. Uh, you've seen, uh, if you registered for the uh, workshop, you saw, uh, responded most likely to our Facebook ad. Um, and uh, I'm one of the partners here at Achieve Therapy. I'm a licensed athletic trainer and strength and conditioning specialist. So that is my, my background. I like to bring up the strength and conditioning aspect because I am biased towards strength. Um, I talk about strength a, a good deal and the importance of strength in helping us resolve uh, not only shoulder pain, but knee, hip issues, low back pain, all of those. I believe there's a, a strength is a very important uh, component of that. So. I'll, I'll reveal that little bit of bias there uh, at the beginning. So, um, and we are here to talk about the, I don't know why my slides are not advancing. I'm just gonna ask everyone, everyone can see my slides okay. Uh, can they not? If someone wants to just give me a little feedback. And I see your other comment there, uh, Larry, about range of motion, but it hurts in some position and weakness, okay. Excellent. <clears throat> a little different slide. I may have to use a different uh, feature here. Tell you what, I'm gonna back up just a little bit, make sure I am in present mode. There we go. All right. So rotator cuff and shoulder pain workshop. Uh, in addition to the rotator cuff, we are gonna talk about the rotary cup or the rotator cup. Sometimes it gets referred to uh, as that, but uh, all the above are gonna be covered today uh, as well as the shoulder pain. Um, and here at Achieve, we like to talk about helping people with pain get back to normal without unnecessary medications, injections, or surgeries. We know that some of those things are needed at some point. In fact, about 10% uh, of the population will not respond to uh, some of the things that we do on the therapy side. Uh, but that remain, means that 90% of the population suffering with shoulder pain or rotator cuff issues, we can help. And those are the people that we want to address. When we decided to begin these lectures or these workshops and presentations on the rotator cuff, uh, we were very surprised to the number of people who raised their hand figuratively and literally saying, hey, I have shoulder pain. Uh, honestly did not anticipate the response that we've had. Uh, so we now realize that there are a lot of people out there suffering from these uh, conditions. So you are not alone, folks. Um, there's a lot of people like you. As I already said, my name is Jeff Barta. I'm one of the partners here at Achieve Therapy, licensed athletic trainer, strength and conditioning specialist. A reminder, as I said at the beginning, if in the chat feature, you can just enter your first name, um, so I know who, who's all on as we uh, respond to some of your questions. Give me an idea of what's going on with your, with your shoulder. Things like what activities bother you? How bad is that pain? And we'll just uh, answer that in the, the chat feature. So we're going to talk about the rotator cuff. What is the rotator cuff? Okay. Uh, you hear a lot about it. And as I already uh, mentioned, sometimes it's referred to something different than the rotator cuff. Uh, but the rotator cuff, is a group of four muscles 
uh, that attach to your shoulder blade and your arm. Um, in fact, what they, uh, that shoulder, uh, those muscles do is hold the upper arm in this little cup that we call the labrum, okay? Our shoulder is like a ball resting on a tee and we have to keep it balanced there. Uh, so these four muscles, <clears throat> uh, one right at the top of our shoulder blade called the supraspinatus, one right below this ridge of the shoulder blade that we call the infraspinatus, um, and then right at the very bottom, we see this muscle called the teres minor. And then if we, so that's looking from the back side. As the picture slide shows, I'll be looking at someone's right shoulder from the back. If you're standing behind them looking at their shoulder, that's what muscles you would be seeing. Um, looking from the front, we have a muscle called the subscapularis. And what isn't depicted really well with this is that muscle actually is on the undersurface of the shoulder blade and between the rib cage and that shoulder blade. It's a very common spot for us to develop something called trigger points, which can be painful. So if you roll your shoulders around and you get some snap, crackle, pops, chances are you have some trigger points in there that we need to uh, address. Um, when we start talking about impingement, we're gonna talk about this area here. And I'm gonna point this out now, this spot that we call the acromium, or this part of the bone, it's actually the front or the, the front part of the spine of the scapula, which comes around and attaches to the shoulder. You see this little point, see how it protrudes out over the top? And that's what I commonly call the roof of the shoulder. And it's very important. This space is hugely important for what goes on with the shoulder and pain you might be experiencing. So uh, keep that in mind as we, as we move forward. Now I say the job of the rotator cuff is to move your arm. I like to point out that not only move your arm, but stabilize your arm. I said that upper arm is like a ball resting on a tee, and we need to keep that balanced. In order for our shoulder to function as well as it should, we need that ball to remain centered in this capsule, okay, right on this tee. So that ball needs to be on the middle of the tee. Uh, if it tips off to the side, or if it's up on the ridge, it's gonna fall off or tilt forward, or place more strain on the shoulder musculature or uh, the other muscles that we'll touch on coming from the neck or the, the mid part of the back, the thoracic spine. So it's all about keeping that arm stable. Our shoulders are one of the most mobile joint that we have in our body and it allows us to do things like raise our arm up over our head, um, off to the side, do things like throw a ball, uh, reach in and, and grab things. Uh, a common complaint that we get from people uh, when we ask about hey what's going on with your shoulder pain um, is reaching uh, reaching uh, back into the car seat uh, or uh, into the back seat of a, a car uh, handing a child in the back something or you know, those of you who work out of your car grabbing some papers out of the back that can be painful so uh, uh, when we do that we place a lot of strain on the on the shoulder when it isn't balanced well. Uh, so the rotator cuff, uh, those of you who received the, the handout that was sent to you, uh, you can follow along with this and we'll answer these questions as we go. So if you have that handout, what is the rotator cuff? We say we have four muscles that help move your arm. Okay. And I do not know why my slides don't want to move. Okay. All right. So when we talk about shoulder movement, there's four areas that work together in order for that shoulder to move well. Uh, the first part of that being the neck. Uh, now, the neck, you can't really see in this in the top right. You see the, the spine of the neck uh, over here. But these yellow things coming off are the nerves that dive off of the spine and call them from there. And up in the shoulder, uh, we, that complex of nerves we refer to as the brachial plexus. You don't need to worry about the, the four aspects of the brachial uh, plexus or those four nerves that are listed there, but each of those innervate different muscles and different parts of the, from the neck down to their fingertips. And that can be a source of issues for people when we're talking about shoulder pain. Um, it may not be coming from the shoulder, it may be coming from the neck. So we need the neck to, to move well. And we have, uh, uh, on the top, you have a picture of a healthy spine, 
uh, probably someone less than 18. Uh, I'm guessing the majority of us look more like the bottom pitcher, that osteoarthritic uh, uh, spine. If you're over the age of 50, like myself, uh, you probably have some of that going on, that degeneration. Uh, if you've ever been uh, had x-rays taken and someone has asked uh, or you've been told that you have degenerative joint disease, this is what it looks like in the neck, okay? We get bony osteophytes uh, building up and we get a little uh, protrusion. We don't have a nice clean joint line like we have here, um, but we have this cragged uh, appearance in that Going back to that slide where I showed those nerves, those nerves are coming out from in here and coming through this opening that we call a foramen. And as you see, it fills in that space. We start to compromise the amount of area that that nerve has to glide through. And I say glide because our nerves aren't static and they aren't rigid. They're meant to move as we move our bodies. Otherwise they would tear with a, a strenuous activity. Um, so when we start to get some of these osteoarthritic changes that occur with age, we, we limit the space that that nerve has to move through there. On top of that, we put some muscles and when those muscles get tightened from a, a being in a extended, spending extended, extended periods of time in a, a forward position or poor posture, uh, that tissue can get tight, putting even more pressure on those nerves as they dive off. So the neck is a very important part of shoulder movement. The collarbone is another one and it's an area that we don't commonly think of because uh, we feel this bone on the front part of our shoulder, this very rigid structure, but that rigid structure needs to move. As you can see circled here out on the, the end of our, our shoulder, this area here we call the acromioclavicular joint where that acromion that I mentioned earlier, that point coming forward from the shoulder blade comes in contact with the end of our collarbone, uh, the clavicle, and so we call it the acromioclavicular joint or the AC joint. And that's where shoulder separations occur. Okay? So we talk about shoulder separations versus shoulder dislocations. That's the difference right there is it's this joint that's being involved rather than this joint below it, the glenohumeral joint. And that's where that ball has fallen off the tee, if you will. Okay? That's the difference between those two uh, things. They're very distinct, uh, distinctly different injuries. The other end of the collarbone articulates with our chest, our sternum here, and there's a small joint here, and there's a piece of cartilage in there, and it allows that collarbone to rotate. So when we go to raise our arm up over our head, our collarbone actually has to rotate forward uh, in order for us to elevate the arm. So if we've had an injury, we've fallen on that point of the shoulder, for those of you that are former athletes, I know there's at least one in the group uh, who've uh, had a, uh, an injury from hockey or football where you got hit from the side or fell onto the point of your shoulder, we could have got some gapping here, some separation. And with that, as that heals, if we don't maintain good movement as we recover from an injury, we can get some scarring down or some connective tissue hardening and it limits the motion either here or here uh, at either end of the collarbone. So the collarbone is important for shoulder movement as well in an area that needs to be assessed when someone has shoulder pain. The shoulder blade uh, resides on the back uh, of our shoulder, articulates with the, uh, the upper end of the arm. And as you saw at that initial slide I put up is where all four muscles of the rotator cuff reside, okay? We refer to the shoulder blade and how it interacts with the rib cage as the scapulothoracic uh, joint, okay? So our shoulder blade needs to guide and sync with the upper arm as we go to elevate it. So there has to be a rotational component and an elevation component to that shoulder blade when we move our arm in order for that humeral head, the end of that large uh, upper arm bone, in order for that to stay in place. Now, things that can impact that shoulder blade is tightness, that, going back to postural things, where we're bent over, maybe our work activities require us to, to bend over and do repetitive activities of pushing and pulling. And you maybe notice that with some people where they really have a rounded posture and you see that shoulder blade, maybe walking down the beach, you see someone, their shoulder blades almost look like they're gonna fall off the side of their body. That means some of those muscles have been stretched out that run along, uh, that hold our uh, shoulder blade 
against their body and, and close to the spine. Um, but we can also get shortened muscles. We see that a lot in the muscles of the neck as they come down from the spine of the neck down to the shoulder blade. Uh, if you find yourself after a period of time rubbing the back of your neck, you feel a little tone in there. That's what I'm talking about. When those tissues get tight, uh, they can pull on that shoulder blade and keep it from moving uh, in the rhythm that is necessary for the shoulder to move well. So we'll talk about scapulohemoral rhythm as being and balance as being an important part of shoulder pain and managing shoulder pain. Um, and we have the rib cage. We don't think of the rib cage as uh, very often unless we've fallen on it or been involved in an accident or uh, a blow to the side. Um, and we think of that rib pain. And now uh, the ribs uh, move with every breath we take, so they can be very painful. But what a lot of people don't realize is the rib cage starts very, very high on the body. And the first rib is actually a very common source of uh, pain in the shoulder. If you reach just behind your, or, uh, go up to your collarbone and move towards the back until you run into the meaty part of your neck, that large muscle that we call that trapezius, if you, if you press down right in the front of that, you'll feel something rigid. And that's actually where our first rib uh, begins. And if you look closely at this slide, you can see that that first rib comes and articulates with the spine. And keep in mind, we have those nerves coming across here. And some of those nerves uh, dive underneath this first or over this first rib and then underneath this collarbone as they come down to innervate the shoulder. Uh, the muscles of the shoulder blade and then down our arm. So when we're in a sustained posture or again we've had a fall that first rib can elevate or get stuck and sometimes simply getting in and getting that up that first rib to move and get that reset will relieve. It, uh, it'll allow a lot more motion and reduce your pain. In fact it's a, one of the first things that we look at in assessing shoulder pain is is there some first rib involvement and that's the source of our, our pain. So the rib cage is not only down towards our belly or where we feel that you feel the margins of your rib, but it comes up very high and articulates with the neck and muscles that uh, attach to that first rib and the second rib run over to that shoulder blade. So uh, it's all linked together. So you see there's a lot of moving parts here and that's what makes solving shoulder pain uh, such a, a, a challenging issue. And uh, as a side note to show how challenging it is, and, and uh, I made reference to the number of shoulder patients that we're seeing or the amount of shoulder pain that we're, we're seeing in the population. For that reason specifically, we just spent 16 hours last week with all of our staff. We put them through a continuing education um, course. So all of our clinical staff knows how to treat shoulder pain and has uh, improved their, their skill set. So we just did 16 hours of combined classroom and lab work uh, to help equip our therapists and our PTAs and our athletic trainers to uh, uh, serve our patient population. So it takes a lot of ongoing uh, training to, to stay on top of that. So how do you come to specialize in shoulder pain? I'll talk specifically about myself. Um, I uh, grew up uh, uh, west of Grand Forks here, about 50 miles, in a small town called uh, uh, Michigan, where I was uh, a mighty, mighty bulldog at one point, um, and uh, enjoyed uh, participating in all the activities. My senior year, however, I dove for a ball on the football field, fell on the point of my shoulder, and, and uh, broke my collarbone. So when I was talking about the movement and the importance of that sh uh, collarbone in our ability to raise our arm, that's where I first realized that without realizing it. It wasn't until I got into college and in, uh, out here at the University of North Dakota that I realized the importance of having a fully functional collarbone because a couple weeks after my injury, I attempted to run as a dog was chasing me. And uh, even that arm, the, the running motion to move my arms back and forth, I did not have the mobility in my collarbone. I found it very, very painful. So we need that. Um, rotation in the collarbone. And that's where I first started looking at, hey, how complicated is this shoulder? Uh, pursued a degree in athletic training at the uh, UND here where I was able to work with the athletic teams back in the uh, 80s. Um, after graduation, I started with uh, one of my current partners, uh, Cliff Lafreniere with a company called Great Plains Physical Therapy. Um, and even going back to that time, we were very uh, 
diligent in, in our continuing education and pursued uh, top sources throughout the, the country. Uh, bring people in here to Grand Forks to educate our staff and, and others, um, as well as traveling uh, across the country to see uh, uh, experts in that area. In 1996, we became part of Health South Sports Medicine, the top notch, uh, the leading sports medicine provider in the country at that time, and uh, had the opportunity to uh, follow and be taught by some of the leading experts in the country. Um, those of you who may have children in athletics or follow the news, uh, the name of uh, Dr. Jim Andrews, Jim Andrews was part of Health South Sports Medicine. And Dr. Andrews has been a little more, has been vocal in the last few years talking about early specialization and how that can be detrimental to our kids. So uh, that's maybe where you've heard the name uh, Dr. Jim Andrews, but had the opportunity to uh, be taught by him uh, as part of Health South. And then back in 2003, we created the entity, which is now known as the Chief Therapy. As I said at the beginning, I'm one of the four uh, original founders. Uh, right now, there's seven of us partners involved in uh, Achieve Therapy, and we have uh, 25 clinicians across, spread across our eight clinics in North Dakota and Minnesota. And uh, we all make a point to learn about shoulder pain. Now, the key to shoulder pain, and this is the point now, I'll refer you back to that little chat feature. If you haven't already, give me an indication as to what's going on with your, uh, with your shoulder and where you might be having the pain or what kind of pain you might be having, uh, that would be uh, great. Um, the, um, I'm just gonna see if we have any new ones here. I do not in the chat. Uh, so your responses to some of my earlier ones. Thank you, thank you, thank you, appreciate that. Um, the first question we ask when people come in is, is your pain re reproducible, okay? Is it, no matter what you do, you encounter pain with the same movement? Okay. And that is very important when we start dealing with uh, shoulder pain, because uh, we want to know what day-to-day -day activities make your pain worse. Okay. Is it reaching overhead, carrying objects, lifting something? Doesn't have to be weight, can be lifting child, can be lifting groceries, can be lifting your briefcase. Okay. I already talked about reaching behind your back, whether that's reaching into the back seat of the vehicle or simply pulling on a jacket, you know, now that the weather's warm or heavy winter coats are put away. But some people have difficulty simply pulling on their jacket. For the ladies, it might be something like putting on a brassiere and having to uh, not be able to fasten it, uh, reach behind themselves to fasten it and have to spin it around. Uh, so getting dressed can be an issue. And of course, we already talked about at the beginning, sleeping. Do you have uh, pain sleeping? Um, those day-to-day -day activities, if your pain always occurs with one of those, meaning it's reproduced every time you do it, we know that we can reduce your pain, okay? So if it's reproducible, we know there's a cause and it can be reduced because then we can address that cause. Those movements uh, point us in the right direction as to uh, where we want to look at. Uh, the comments I made uh, earlier about all the moving parts, those four aspects of the shoulder that are important. Um, uh, so Larry, so uh, looking at your answer, you can reach behind you and get dressed. Weakness while reaching overhead and can't sleep at night. There we go back to the, the sleep at night um, question. So uh, we will probably spend a little more time than normal talking about the sleeping. Um, so uh, getting to the root cause of it is important. Uh, the assessment of your shoulder becomes very, very important. So what's the number one mistake made with shoulder pain? Now, I'm sure no one out there has done this, but the number one mistake that we see people make is it's ignored, okay? For us guys, it can be a little uh, uh, independent, say, oh, it'll get better. I don't uh, need to worry about it. Um, we might say, you know, everyone here at the office or everyone here at work has shoulder pain, so I'm just like the rest of them. It comes normally with age. There is a little age factor, granted. Um, but we do things to ignore that pain, okay? Um, so uh, rather than ignore that pain, we want to begin to handle it. Now, ignoring it is a way of handling that pain, but it sounds more like excuses than anything else, right? Um, yeah. Uh, Everyone has it, my parents had it, my brothers have it, my sisters have it, we all have pain, okay? Um, everyone at work has it, uh, 
but again, we just kind of put it off and not really deal with it. The second thing that we can do is we can alter it. Now, how might we alter it? Okay. Maybe we get ourselves dressed differently. Okay. Um, we, instead of uh, uh, wearing a, a pants with a belt loop or that we have to put on a belt, we buy some elastic bands, okay? We stop raising our arm as much as it was. We limit our activities, uh, we limit how we go about work, okay? Or maybe we pursue over-the-counter medications. You know, we start popping the Advil, the ibuprofen, uh, make use of ice packs or heat packs, whichever one makes you feel better. We go see the physician and we get injections, okay? Now, those will help and it can provide some relief to the first aspect of shoulder pain, which is the inflammation, okay? That's primarily what those things all do, the over-the-counter medications, the injections, uh, maybe some special splinting or straps. Um, maybe you tape your shoulder, uh, but those are temporary solutions and short-term short solutions that only alter the pain. They don't get to the root cause of it and allow us to handle it, which is the third way we can uh, deal with our pain is actually get in, find that root cause. Are we dealing with a muscle imbalance? Are we dealing with some bony uh, issues? Uh, if you remember that slide, I talked about the, orth uh, the osteoarthritic spine. You can have some of that osteoarthritis into the shoulder over that acromion. In fact, um, I'm trying to remember who I spoke with uh, yesterday, I believe it was, uh, talking about they, they are actually scheduled for surgery to go in and have what's called a chromioplasty where we have some of the arthritic changes and I'll, I'll touch on that in a moment. Uh, but uh, we need to get in and handle it and that's where uh, what we do from a standpoint of therapy can, can make a difference. Okay, so what are the most common causes of shoulder pain? First one is problems in the neck. Talked about the uh, importance of those nerves diving off. Okay, as we look here at this, this slide, here's that group of that brachial plexus and all those nerves coming uh, across here. As you can see, it goes over that first rib and then behind the collarbone. Well, we have all these muscles attaching um, from our collarbone and our shoulder blade to our neck and they reside and rest right over the, that uh, tissue. So if they become tight, they can create some tension on those nerves and even our our posture uh, of the neck uh, becomes important because when our posture tilts, uh, pulls forward, you can envision the spine bending forward, okay? It's gonna pull on those nerves and, oops, jumping ahead. Uh, if we have some of these osteoarthritic changes going on, we have limited movement and we have compression on those nerves and we're more apt to irritate that. So when we look at this osteoarthritic spine, uh, I don't know, is there anyone in the audience who has, is currently taller than they were last year or two years ago or even in high school? Wait, see if there's any answers. Oops. No one's jumping in. So I'll take that to mean much like yourself. Uh, that's not where I'm changing in stature. Uh, this is what happens over time. Our spine compresses even on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, if you've noticed getting into your vehicle, maybe in the morning, you get in and adjust that rear view mirror as you back out of your driveway or your garage, drive off to work, you know, and, uh, your car sits at work all day. Uh, you get back in it at the end of the day and you realize you look in the mirror to back up and you see that it's, it's changed again. You have to make an adjustment, okay? So we shrink in stature a little bit just through gravity compressing our spine. The, these discs right here are uh, very uh, are primarily uh, water filled, There's a lot of uh, fluid in them and they can get compressed over time and that space closes down. So we end up looking more like this by the end of the day than this. Now, it's not that dramatic, but it just makes the point. Our spine compresses over the day. We had years and years of being on our feet on top of that and our spine is a little smaller. So we do run out of space in the neck for those nerves to um, uh, to glide through and, and uh, function normally uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? So, uh, next common cause of shoulder pain is impingement. 
Uh, I'm guessing that there are a few of those, a few of you out there who've had that diagnosis, or maybe you've done some reading and you realize you have impingement. Those that I've spoken with, and Larry, you mentioned the a painful arc of motion. That painful arc of motion is something that tells us, yeah, you have uh, impingement, okay? So that impingement occurs when we try to elevate our arm, whether it's out to the side, as this picture shows, or rise, raising out in front of us. Um, but as we elevate our arm, those muscles of the rotator cuff, keep in mind that their job is to keep that head of the humerus centralized in this joint here. But if it doesn't, as we raise that arm, those muscles are gonna pull that upper arm upward and we're gonna bang into the roof of our shoulder as I call it, which is primarily our acromion, which is part of that, that scapula, okay? So going back to our anatomical slides and envision that arm raising up. So our arm is moving up in this arc and that ball is rotating and gliding in this shallow dish that we call the uh, labrum in the glenoid. Uh, if these muscles aren't doing their job, that arm will elevate and we bump into this acromion. The osteoarthritic changes that can occur at the acromion, if those, uh, to our uh, viewer who's gonna have the acromioplasty, basically what that means is this acromion, and I'll use this picture right here, over time this hook has dropped down. We've got some bony buildup for whatever reason. And some of us, not everyone has the same shape, the chromium here. Uh, one is nice and flat like this, and there's some that actually almost look like a a beacon will come down and that minimizes our space. So not only do we have these tendons of the rotator cuff and these muscles present here, but over each of these tendons is a small thin fluid filled sac called the bursa. And with continual repetitive motions and banging up into that roof, it becomes irritated and inflamed. And maybe there's some of you who have been told that you have bursitis or even tendonitis just that ending, that itis, just tells us that we have inflammation to that tissue. So bursitis, inflammation to the bursa. Tendonitis, inflammation to that tendon. Uh, so that's what we're referring to is those thin fluid-filled sacs over those areas. And it's primarily because they're getting pinched or impinged in this space as we go to elevate that, that arm. Make sense? All right, posture. I know everyone out there has perfect posture, right? Uh, and no one's ever been told that they, they slouch or uh, uh, by uh, parents, grandparents. Um, I always say I should have listened to my mother and my grandmother. And uh, when they told me to sit up straight, that would have solved a, a lot of uh, issues. Okay. Oops, I am going to back up. Here. There's my posture slide. So one little test that I have uh, just to demonstrate the, the importance of, of posture is you can either stand up or move back in your chair. And what I want you to do, sit up nice and tall, just like you're supposed to, and take those arms. If you have a bad shoulder, only take the, the good shoulder and, and raise this up. But uh, either one or both arms, just raise that up as far as you can, sitting nice and upright. You got those eyes pointed forward, that chin nice and level, that chest is up, and see how far you can raise that arm before you encounter either limitations or pain. Okay? Now bring it down. Now I have give you permission to, to slouch. Okay? We're going to uh, round our posture forward, let that chin drop to our chest. I always say I, I envision myself being back in Mrs. Walden's English class where I sat and slouched in my desk, almost fell out of it, but Anyway, uh, I want you to just round forward. And now in that slouch posture, I want you to try to raise your arm, okay? Now, chances are, you're gonna find it a little more difficult to do that. You're not gonna feel like you can raise it as high. You may even encounter pain, okay? So I wanna back up to that, that slide showing that acromion. So what happens when we slouch, that shoulder blade rounds forward and slides up and this acromion, get my pointer going again, that acromion tilts this way and down into this space, okay? So slouching limits our space once again, lending to impingement and loss of motion, 
okay? So we don't have the ability to move as well because we just don't have the space for that arm to move. And we start beating up on that tissues in which can lead to one of those things, a tendonitis or bursitis or a full-blown impingement uh, syndrome, okay? So posture is very important for, for stabilizing that, okay? So what does successful treatment look like in, in dealing with shoulder pain, okay? We do hands-on PT. I mentioned the continuing education course that we put our entire staff through, uh, well, now two weeks ago. Um, the, uh, a good part of that, we spent four hours just working on, on the lab, learning to assess the shoulder, put people through movement patterns, and then some treatment te techniques where we're actually uh, mobilizing that issue, that tissue. Okay? Uh, talked about sometimes the source of that uh, shoulder pain or uh, shoulder pain can be the tightness in the, the neck muscles. I uh, talked about trigger points or mentioned them briefly, the subscapularis. There's some techniques that we can go in and reduce the uh, influence of the trigger points by releasing them. It could be a, just a, a pressure technique using our hands. Uh, we use a special tool or technique that we call dry needling, uh, which is not acupuncture. It's dry needling. We actually go in and try to release that, that trigger point. Um, but sometimes uh, it's as simply as mobilizing that first rib. Remember I talked about that high point of the shoulder where that first rib starts and the muscles that attach to it if that's stuck sometimes it's just a matter of mobilizing that moving that restoring some normal motion to that neck and shoulder and that will free up uh, your shoulder to move the well as well as it should uh, relieve that pain um, and make you feel better okay I alluded to my bias at the beginning as to strength so uh, strength in muscle memory strengthening that tissue is uh, a big part of what we do. Common question that we get asked is, what are the best exercises to do for shoulder pain and rotator cuff uh, issues? And if you would like, I, we created a list of three common shoulder exercises. I'm more than happy to send that out to you. So if you'd like that, uh, again, use that chat feature and just say, yeah, I'd like to receive it. Um, and if you can, um, Maybe you put your email in there because uh, when you register it, I have first names and some emails. So uh, your on screen name doesn't always match up with the email if you'd like me to send that out to you. Uh, so just let me let us know where to, to send it and we can send it. But I want to preface that with saying that even though these are three good exercises for the shoulder, they may not be the best exercises for you. Okay. Um, we said there's all these moving parts with the shoulders. There's four components of that rotator cuff, okay? Not all of them may need work. One may need it worse than the other. The most common one is the supraspinatus. So identifying which tissues are involved or what that underlying cause is dictates what exercises are gonna be best for you. So we always wanna personalize that. So uh, Google is a great source to gain information, but it may not be the best information for you, okay? Um, so we always want to, uh, whenever we can, customize your exercise program. So just be a little cautious. If you're out there looking at videos or an exercise sheet saying, hey, exercises for impingement, three exercises for a rotator cuff, just know that they're good exercises, but they may not be the best for you. And that's where visiting with a, someone like a, an exercise specialist, if you're uh, at the gym working out or you're, um, uh, working with your physical therapist, uh, they will get you the appropriate exercises. And thank you for that. I see uh, Rose, Chris, Shelly, uh, uh, we'll get those exercises sent to you. And uh, Marie, uh, thanks for using that. We will uh, get that. I have my faithful assistant. I should have introduced Jenna at the beginning, but Jenna, my, uh, my uh, compatriot here, my right hand uh, lady, uh, is, uh, recording those and we'll get those sent out to you. So it's just three simple exercises. And if you get that and you have questions about it or um, maybe don't quite understand, uh, get a full picture of what I've mapped out and with the pictures and the descriptions, feel free to reach out to us and we'll, we'll address those. But be very cautious with them. Um, sometimes we can uh, go too quickly and move too much. For guys, we tend to use too much resistance or too much weight. That's a, a, a common thing. More is not always better. So we want to get uh, movement first and that will allow us to gain strength. So we talked about the, 
uh, gaining movement and mobility before we can really start beefing that up. And even more important is that we get that pain out of the way to begin with. Because as long as we have pain present in that tissue, if you, we're dealing with an acute injury where we have some inflamed tissue, we have a hot bursa, we aren't going to get that muscle strength. Our body's built to protect itself. So when there's pain present, it sends a mus message for muscles to shut down so we don't strain our body as much. So we need to interrupt that process. And that's where when we talk about altering it, that's what altering it does. So sometimes altering it can, uh, with over-the-counter medications or ice, can give us a false feeling of security and we actually injure ourselves further because uh, we've reduced that inflammation, but we haven't built up the strength that muscles in a, uh, or that tendon is in a weakened position. And then we ask it to do some of the same activities and we overload that. So be cautious with those exercises and seek out a, a professional when you, when you can. Okay. All right. Uh, mentioned the trigger point therapy. Uh, we can do manual therapy for that. Just some, uh, uh, trigger point pressure or pressure point therapy or the dry needling. Uh, one of the other things that we utilize in dealing with a lot of that acute pain, that inflammatory response is something that we call cold laser. It's triphasic uh, photomodulation is the real name of it, but cold uh, laser rolls off a little bit easier. Uh, and uh, we use that in conjunction with some of the movement therapies. We may use it early on in the treatment to reduce that pain, enhance the healing and free up the motion so we can train and strengthen that muscle and get those muscles functioning the way they should. So uh, those are all things that help us resolve the pain issue at the beginning so we can work towards normalizing uh, treatment. So what to do next? Okay. Because you've raised your hand and said, hey, I'm having some troubles. I'd like to uh, see someone. And I know some of you are already seeing uh, one or uh, of our therapists are scheduled for that. We are offering a, a, a jump the queue uh, because of your participation in here. So if you're experiencing shoulder pain right now, and that's anything above, I'm gonna say a level of five, okay? If you say on a scale of zero to 10, my pain level is, is a seven, chances are you're in need of some of these treatments and techniques to alleviate that pain, okay? So if, your pain is that bad where it's impacting what you do day to day or keeping you from doing activities on a day to day basis, especially work activities. That's where we want to intervene earlier than later. The earlier we intervene in uh, resolving that pain, the sooner we get to the solution and the easier it is to overcome that. If we wait too, uh, too long, if we kick that can down the road, uh, it's much more difficult to get you back to normal if you've had pain for a longer period of time. So the sooner we can intervene and reduce that pain, uh, the better. So you can reach out to us by our website. Uh, when you visit that, it um, uh, looks like this. Uh, if you've ever been to our website and if you'll go down and click to start your recovery today, you click on that button, you'll see a screen like this that requests a consult. So there's two things you can say, you know what? I have pain right now. I know I need to see a therapist. Um, just indicate that, provide your name, your email address, your contact information. Give us an idea uh, what date you're looking for um, sooner than later. Or if the schedule says, you know what, I'm going to be, I'm out of town. Maybe you're viewing this from uh, the lake. Uh, if you are, congrats for uh, being able to relax. Uh, indicate the best time to reach you and um, in the comments, just tell us a little bit of what's going on with your shoulders and where you'd like to be seen. As I said, we have eight locations and this going across all of our formats. I'm not sure where everybody is. I will not assume that everybody's in the Grand Forks area. So here in Grand Forks, we have three locations on the Grand Forks side. We have our East Grand Forks location. So you can uh, indicate which of those you'd like to see. Um, north of us, we have our facilities in Grafton and Park River. And then down in Lake Country, for those of you who might be watching down there, we have offices in Park Rapids and Detroit Lakes. So just uh, indicate which of those would be the most convenient for you. And we could get you set up with a physical therapy visit. We're also offering uh, consults, okay? If it isn't, it's not so bad, you can deal with it. You say, yeah, you know, once in a while I have some discomfort, but I just want some tips. Uh, we can arrange a 15 minute consult with one of our therapists just to say, yeah, you're right. Um, 
well, let's just change this with your posture. Let's maybe look at this in your, your uh, office setup. And a simple accommodation like that can make a difference, uh, a big difference for that shoulder pain because of the postural changes that you're encountering. So we're offering those consults, uh, give you an opportunity to do that. And with the whole COVID thing, we can do a telehealth as well. If you're at home and you're a little leery about venturing out, we can arrange a uh, online conversation just like this, only we'd activate the camera so we could see you and we could view what you're doing. In fact, we have a separate Facebook group called the Healthy Home Office for people working at home. You don't even have to be working at home, but anywhere in an office environment. If you think that some of that shoulder pain that you have uh, is because of your setup, either at home, your home office or your work office, um, you're working from a laptop a lot more than uh, usual instead of a desktop. Those things can uh, add some postural stresses to your body. And we have uh, Nicole Chine, one of our physical therapists and ergonomic specialists. And right now she's offering uh, online consults. It's just a matter of reaching out to her saying, hey, I'd like my office space assessed. She'll say, okay, I want you to take pictures of your setup. Uh, these different views and angles, this is what we're looking at. Uh, she'll communicate with you, uh, may depend on what kind of problems you're having, and she can do a virtual assessment of your workspace and offer recommendations. So if that's an interest uh, for you as well, you can use the same platform to do it. In fact, we have, uh, when you go to our website, and you go to workshops, you will see on this page, okay, we have our blogs and workshops. If you click on workshops, you will see that there is a link to uh, request an uh, office assessment. Although, as I say that, I think we had that running through the end of the month. I may have to change that. But either way, you go and do this start your recovery, um, you'll get to it as well. You can also text us. Okay? We have two-way texting as a result of it. Uh, uh, you, can, uh, that, uh, you can call that number. It will ring to our main office, or you can text us, and Jenna will get that uh, message. She monitors those and you can request a consult that way or request an online assessment. So uh, either of those uh, work well for uh, you to get in touch with us and say what I, I need help. Okay? So when you come to therapy, what can you expect? We ask you to give us your story just like I've asked you, hey, what's going on with you? You know, what, what, where's your pain? How bad is that pain? What activities bother you? All those give us clues as to what that underlying cause is, whether it's an issue with the neck, whether it's an issue uh, uh, with the posture. Uh, it can tell us, yeah, this definitely is an impingement issue. Each of those presents a different uh, process as to how we're gonna deal with that pain, okay? After we get those clues, we'll put you through some movements. Yeah? Uh, assess your ability to move. Uh, can you raise your arm in this direction? Maybe do some uh, muscle testing. Does this produce pain when we offer some resistance? Um, I know one of you had indicated uh, having pain with the weightlifting. Uh, we talked a little bit of, about that and what that movement uh, uh, and the loading that you might be doing on that shoulder, uh, that could be a source of pain. And even just simply reducing that load can uh, help resolve some of that issue. Um, that allows us all to identify the cause, okay? Keep coming to the, uh, back to the fact that very complicated joint Okay, We've got all those moving parts and each one of them can be the source of, of an issue. Is it muscular? Is it uh, bony arthritis? Is it neurological? We need to identify the cause of that pain in order to solve the patient. Okay, okay. And then we'll outline what successful treatment looks like. Uh, we will say this is what we see. Okay, You have impingement. Um, we have weakened tissue. This is what we're going to do to resolve that pain and this is what you can expect for length of treatment we can resolve that pain in two three four visits but we know that it's going to take us four to six weeks to get that strength back in that particular tissue and this is what it's going to look like so we try to map that out all for you so you know what to expect and know what kind of commitment you have to have towards your treatment in order to resolve that pain okay so uh, we'll get into our frequently asked questions but I'm gonna pause just to wet my whistle a little bit and maybe give you a, a chance to type in uh, any other comments or questions that uh, you may have. 
already. I'm just going to take a quick peek here. Um, got the exercise questions and don't say that they're going to be coming in. Excellent. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Most common question we get when it comes to therapy or taking care of um, issues with the shoulders, does insurance cover this? All the therapies that we provide uh, with just a couple exceptions are covered by insurance providers, okay? The dry needling I mentioned as a treatment for those trigger points, if that's determined to be the cause, is something that is not covered by most insurance plans. There are a couple that do. Uh, but that's where when we call, you know, when we call the schedule, we just get your insurance information and verify what benefits you do have with that. So as a courtesy to our patients, we always do that insurance verification and say, this is what you can expect uh, them to, to pay. Um, you may already know what your co-pays, uh, what your out-of-pocket expenses are, but we can ask uh, specifically uh, what treatments are covered as, as well. So we'll give you an indication if, uh, if there are uh, things that are not covered, okay? Um, Medicare is one that is uh, a little bit different, okay? Um, and to your question, uh, and to answer your question, Marie, you need a doctor referral. Um, if, no. For people under Medicare age and most major uh, payers do not require a referral. North Dakota, Minnesota, in fact, all 50 states have direct access now for physical therapy. You can go directly to your physical therapist and be seen. And as long as we develop a plan of care and get that signed plan of care, insurance will cover that. And I say the plan of care and that pertains to the Medicare individuals so if you're under Medicare, Medicare requires a signed plan of care in order for payment to be rendered, okay? So you can come in and be seen by a therapist, you can initiate uh, therapy, and that initial evaluation, that initial assessment will be covered by them. But what, it, what is needed with that is your uh, therapist will then need to map out that plan of care saying, this is what I saw, this is what we plan to do to resolve that pain or that issue. And this is how long we expect it to take. So we have to take that plan of care, send it to your primary physician. And as long as they sign off on it, anything following with the therapies will be covered under uh, the current limitations of, of uh, that payment plan. So we always want to get that plan of care, whether it's Medicare or not, that outlines things in its communication that we have. If you are of Medicare age and you have a good rapport with your physician, it may simply say, hey, Dr. Jones, um, I wanna go see uh, Lori over at Achieve, uh, will you write me a referral? There are some people that you have that relationship, they're so familiar with the case, and especially if you've talked about some of those before, they'll just write that script and say, yes, I'll do it. Chances are they may say, oh, I want you to come in. I want to do some assessments on my own, maybe look at diagnostics to ensure that physical therapy is appropriate. So um, they may do that before they sign that plan of care. So yes, insurance covers it. Do you need a referral? Um, not necessarily, okay? Hope that makes sense. Uh, um, is there any, does that answer that question or were there something else needed to, uh, address with those particular ones. All right. So uh, next question, if I can get my pointer out of the way. A little delay with my screen. Did shoulder pain happen to do due to old age? Well, old age in itself isn't the cause of the shoulder pain. It's our body's changes to the aging process that produce that. I made that reference to the osteoarthritic changes over wear and tear we had. Over time, we get that wear and tear stress. We get that bony buildup. Uh, our muscles become weaker. Now, every day that we wake up and grow one day older, we lose a tiny amount of muscle tissue and thereby strength. 
thoughts. For that reason, we encourage everyone to remain active, as active as you can, and stay diligent with an exercise regimen. Okay? It might even just be calisthenics, doing some body weight activities, but if we can do day-to-day -day activities to keep our strength levels up and offset that, that normal tiny amount of muscle loss that we have, uh, we can avoid that. But it's not necessarily the old age, but our bodies changes as we uh, age, one of those being the uh, bone spurs and the arthritis and bursitis. Arthritis, an inflammatory condition. We talk about osteoarthritis, that's that bony, uh, the bony changes that we see in the wear and tear on the joints. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is a completely different bird. That's an inflammatory response uh, or uh, an uh, autoimmune issue and more of a disease process. And that typically takes some uh, medications to help alleviate uh, uh, some of that pain and some of the inflammatory responses that you have. It may simply be some diet changes. Nutrition is one thing that we haven't even touched on that has made a big difference in some of those inflammatory responses. And we're learning more and more the importance of our diet in maintaining pain, especially chronic pain in some of these inflammatory conditions. Bursitis is typically related to uh, overuse or compression of the areas. And I talk about impingement. Uh, so bursitis is that inflammation to that bursa. So again, looking at muscle balance and range of motion can go a long way in dealing with the bursitis. Bone spurs, that's where navigating what is producing your pain with a particular movement. Obviously, we don't have x-ray vision, so we can't see that you have bone spurs. It typically comes from the physician screen. We can assume some bone spurs if we see, depending on how your motion feels as we go to elevate that arm, so we can get a feel for it with our hands-on assessments. Uh, but when you have the bone spurs there, we can't go in and reduce those. We can't reverse them. So if they're so, that's where that 10% comes in. They say 10% people with shoulder pain may re require surgery. Um, that's a very common procedure that acromioplasty where they go in and shave down those bone spurs on the end of the acromion and free up that joint space so we're not impinging on that tissue. Okay? Um, having weakness in my shoulder and arm or hand. Okay? Um, I mentioned the, uh, the muscle loss that we have just aging. It can happen over time. But if we have a sudden weakness in the arm, chances are we're trapping or we're getting some of that, that compression over that nerve and it is not communicating well with those muscles that move our shoulder, our arm, or our hand, okay? Those nerves are responsible for sending messages for those muscles to move. They're also responsible for receiving messages that indicate something's going wrong. Those are the pain receptors that we have, and that's our built-in alarm system for our body that can limit our motion. So when we have an issue going on with the nerve involvement, it can produce that weakness and into the hand, shoulder, arm, or hand. And that leads into some of the sleeping uh, aspect. What is the best sleeping position for shoulder pain? Now, there really isn't, just like with the exercises, one stock answer for everyone. And we know that everyone can't sleep in the same position. But if we had to select one position over the others, it would be lying on our back with our head supported and our arms supported, okay? Comes back to that, that brachial plexus coming off of our uh, a neck and how they serve the, uh, the shoulder, arm, and hand, okay? If you tend to sleep uh, on your side, we're compressing that. We're pushing that humeral head up onto that, into that space. We can create some impingement type pain, but we're also compressing the nerve as well as the blood vessels that accompany those nerves. Our nerves as they come through the body are very oftentimes um, uh, accompanied by an artery and a vein, okay? Not for in the, the larger nerves as they come off, if that happens, but the smaller ones, not necessarily. But there usually is a vascular component to that. And when we compress that tissue by lying on our side or laying with that arm up over our head, tucked underneath our pillow, we're closing down on that space and compressing on maybe the nerve, maybe an artery, maybe our vein. And when our tissue stops receiving the nourishment of oxygen via those, those vessels, they start to send out messages to our body, say, hey, something's wrong. And that's where that can produce some tingling. It's a sign that you need to change something. And that's why we wake up at night and then we, 
we get up, we move around, we uh, uh, do away with that compression, we open up those vessels and we get the nourishment that we need and our pain goes away. So pain at night, chronic aching pain can be a sign of some of those osteoarthritic changes. We've lost space, we've lost circulation, or maybe we already have the presence of a rotator cuff tear, a small tear, and it's just painful. Uh, it can be a, a, an indicator of even some more uh, severe disorders. Um, not all that frequently, but on occasion, we've seen people with some cancerous issues producing that nighttime aching. So there's always that, there is that possibility. But uh, nighttime achiness and with the shoulder is usually from compressing that area by lying on our side or with that arm elevated up over our head. So we're putting everything on stress and compressing those tissues, okay? So our best position is if we can lie on our back, with our pillow supporting our upper, uh, our shoulder blade and our head. So uh, your, your pillow functions much like a mattress and should fill in that space of the neck with that normal curvature to your neck. Then one common fault I see with people using the pillow and sleeping and they say, hey, uh, I, I have shoulder pain even sleeping on my back. Sometimes they position their head high up or low on the pillow and that pillow is actually, and they have a big fluffy pillow or maybe a couple, it's actually pressing their chin towards their chest. So you're sleeping in a little bit of a flexed or forward bent position. And that can put some strain on the neck and into the shoulder, okay? So uh, hopefully that answers that. Do I need surgery for a torn rotator cuff? Not always, okay? There's been documented cases where people with uh, uh, full-blown tears have been able to strengthen the tissues around and not have to uh, have that tissue repaired. Keep in mind the cuff is comprised of four muscles, the most common area uh, or common tendinous portion of that cuff, the supraspinatus, is uh, the site of many of those tears from the subscapularis uh, just because of their location. Um, but we can develop strength and return a normal function to a shoulder without surgery on occasion, okay? Not everyone can have it. And we don't know that all rotator cuff tears are a source of pain. There's an interesting study where they pulled people off the street and they found that 70% of the people presented with a torn rota rotator cuff but had no symptoms of, of pain. They were asymptomatic. So just like we see in, in backs, there's plenty of people running around with bulged discs without pain. We can see people running around uh, without uh, with a torn rotator cuff or a partial tear in that cuff not having any pain. So uh, if we can function and we can manage the pain or have no pain with it, uh, there may not be a reason for that, that uh, cup to be repaired. Um, if it is impacting your day-to-day -day activities, your ability to function uh, either at home or work, and there's no relief of pain, then surgery is, is definitely an option, okay? Like I said, well, statistics show about 10% of the population with shoulder pain do ultimately end up having surgery, okay? Um, Hope that answers a good part of your questions. If, uh, if you haven't, or if you have some other questions you'd like to address, feel free to type them in the, uh, in the chat feature and we'll, we will review them. Again, there's our contact information for reaching out to us for a consult, whether it's just that uh, complimentary 15 minute screen and, uh, or you can uh, call or text us at that number 701-401-4872. Hopefully you found that helpful. I always like to ask if you could give me a little feedback, I'd appreciate it. If you felt this information was worth the price of admission, maybe give me a thumbs up in the, uh, in the chat feature or the, uh, uh, you should have a little thumbs up or thumbs down uh, feature. So a little feedback would be appreciated. So I'll hang around for a, a little bit and ask, uh, I see, uh, Larry raised your hand, or was that a, meant to be a thumbs up, I hope? Oh, thumbs up, I see, okay, <laughs> good, appreciate it. So uh, uh, share this information with your friends and family, okay? Uh, we will be doing these on an ongoing basis. Keep an eye out for, uh, for us on Facebook or our webpage. Uh, we list them, and uh, we're always happy at 
part of treating people's pain is the education, and it's a very important part. So whenever we can help people uh, uh, troubleshoot their problems, uh, we love to do it. And I love to talk. So uh, if I don't bore you and you don't get tired of my voice, I will be on here as frequently as needed to answer questions. Um, little FYI, next week we're going to do a, a, a webinar on low back pain. So we've got the word out on that, so I'll share with a friend. Uh, keep in mind, we have our Facebook page, which you can reach out to us on. We have that Healthy Home Office Facebook group. So if you're working from home, or maybe people in your office or your coworkers are complaining about some aches and pains uh, by sitting at a desk or working on their laptop now instead of a desktop, share that information with them. We're more than happy to answer those questions. And uh, please reach out to us and let us help you achieve performance for life. All right. And I see no other uh, questions or comments. So if that's everyone's good, we'll sign off and wish you a, a happy Wednesday. Past midday, so we're over the hump. We're heading down the home stretch. Get out and enjoy this nice weather we're having.